So we are wearing white vestments this weekend uh, because we celebrate, as we do on the last weekend of each liturgical year, the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. This feast was first declared almost 100 years ago uh, in the Jubilee year of 1925 by Pope Pius XI. We can ask ourselves many questions about this feast referring to Christ as our king. King of what? King of who? King of where? When did he become king? And so on. There are likely many other and better questions than these, but I would like to focus on one question, and that is the question of why. Why is Jesus our king? And of course, our readings have something to say in answer to that question of why. Our first reading comes from chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, and the portion we read this weekend comes as part of Daniel's report about a vision that he had had. And so up until the point where we start tonight's text, Daniel recounts his vision where he saw four beasts, a lion, like, a lion-like beast with wings that walked around on two feet with a, quote, human mind, a bear-like beast with three tusks in its mouth, and the bear was also, quote, given the order to arise and devour much flesh, a leopard-like beast with four wings and four heads, and to this leopard was given dominion, and finally a fourth beast that Daniel describes as terrifying, horrible, of extraordinary strength and arrogance. Now the lion is said to represent the Babylonian Empire. The bear represents the Medes. The leopard represents the Persians, and the final unnamed beast represents Alexander. Each of these empires had kings, and as Daniel's vision continues, they all fell. All of this precedes the portion that we hear today, where we hear about the one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven to whom was given dominion, glory, and kingship, a king for all peoples, all nations, a king whose dominion cannot be taken away and whose kingdom cannot fall like the kingdoms of mankind, a king whose kingship cannot be destroyed. And of course, that king that we hear of in that, in that first reading is Jesus. He is not a menacing beast like the lion, the leopard, or the bear, or the ten-horned beast. And his reign is not temporary, as it was for the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians. Rather, he is like us, a son, the son who comes to us, the son who is the eternal king. The eternal kingship, a king for all of time, the kingship that extends to all peoples and all nations, a king then for all people, explains why, at least in part, we say that our Lord Jesus is the king of the universe. Our responsorial psalm then echoes that eternal nature of his kingdom, and it states that your throne stands firm from of old, from everlasting you are. And then the psalm ends by describing God's decree as worthy of our trust, which raises another aspect of Christ that also explains why he is properly regarded as our king. And that aspect is his fidelity and faithfulness to his father. Our second reading from the book of Revelation begins by stating and describing Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He who freely gave his own blood to free us from our sins. He who conquered death, not on some battlefield, but through the cross. Through the limitless fidelity and faithfulness to his father that led him to that very cross. He who the book of Revelation tells us today now rules the kings of the earth. This is our second reading. Is He who, as our second reading tells us, loves us. And when the reading end as, ends as it does with the description of Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and what was, who is to come, the Almighty, we might do well to ponder that conclusion in terms of Christ's love for us. Christ who loves us now, Christ who loved us then, Christ who will continue to love us for eternity. His is a kingdom of love, a kingdom of service, 
a kingdom that is unlike anything this world has ever seen. He is not like the earthly kings we know, not like the beast that Daniel saw in his vision. And that perhaps takes us to Pilate, questioning Jesus in our gospel. Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Notice that Pilate's question limits Jesus' king. Jesus' kingdom, are you the king of the Jews, a particular people in a particular place, an earthly understanding of kingship? Jesus then tells him that his kingdom does not belong to this world. and In other words, that his kingdom is different, is greater than any kingdom this world has known. It takes us back to that question, why? Why is Jesus the king of the universe? Because he and he alone alone is worthy of that title. History recounts the rise and falls of kingdoms, power struggles, if you wish, by which one nation imposes its will upon another nation or people. <coughs> the kingdom thereby created rests, at least to some extent, upon human power dynamics, battlefields, weapons, death. And it is perhaps for those reasons that kingdoms have come and gone throughout history because they rest on a foundation that only holds on for so long as they possess the human power to sustain them. Jesus' kingdom does not rest upon that foundation. His foundation is one of service, one of self-sacrifice. It is a kingdom based on who God is. It is a kingdom that is based on love. Love that found expression in the upper room where Jesus got up wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed the feet of his disciples, one of which, as we know, betrayed him, one of which, as we also know, denied him, and all but one of which, as we know, abandoned him in his hour of need. Love that led him to embrace the cross and submit to a punishment he did not deserve. Submission in service, in faith, in fidelity, in love to his Father. Submission and service, faith, fidelity, and love to us, to free us from our sins by his blood. Love that finds expression tonight in the Eucharist that we will celebrate together. Death on the cross did not destroy that kingdom of love. His kingdom did not fall, but rather his kingdom has come. Through his re resurrection, Jesus has conquered death, the human weapon of war that we now lay down in the hope and in the love of life, eternal life with Christ in his kingdom. And it is now our charge to enter into that love, to enter into that kingdom as his disciples, to give him glory and praise, to live lives of love and service, and to experience the joy that is his love, and to know that our just, merciful, and loving King lives, which is why we properly call him our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe.